Okay, that's yeah. old school. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. uh that's we old as Mr. Redcoats. Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. I created the number one online body language course, BodyLanguageTactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase? Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, persuasion, and influence, and teach those things to the general public every day. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together the number one bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street or corporate America. Today is part two of the Gabby Petito series we're doing. We're going to talk about the traffic stop and the body, body language we saw on Gabby as well as Brian Laundry. Greg? Yeah, guys, this is a bad time. She's been found dead. The cause of death is homicide, and Brian Laundry is still nowhere to be found. We're going to tell you what we saw. We're not going to conjecture. We're not going to try to tell you what happened. We don't know. We're going to tell you what we see in the body language on the traffic stop. That's it. All right. You ready? Yeah. Bravo, Romeo, India, Alpha, November. And then what? And his reaction wants to do what? He's going to be out of Florida. He just grabbed you? Did he, did he hit you though? I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him, but then I understand if he hit you, but we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Because, you know, where did he hit you? No, don't worry. Just be honest. Do you want me to kick it up some more? Do you have any water? I will see if I can find some. Okay, don't worry. Thank you. 
All right. As we go through this, keep in mind, you can just hear the sound go out because there are some things the officers are talking about that they can't make public. So, Greg, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, guys, nothing is good about watching this because we know the terminal end and what happened to this point. And so none of this is good. We're not trying to beat up this young lady or we're, we're not conjecturing what actually happened. What I'm going to tell you to pay attention to is language around behaviors. We're looking for body language and behaviors. A person goes through it. Yes, she is emotional and yes, she is guarded. And we've heard from many, many people that that's an indicator that someone is being abused. But I'm going to also tell you that when you pull over someone and they're being questioned by the police, they're going to be guarded as well. It's the nature of human beings. We'll see it in her and we'll see it in him. If she is guarding and that is a symptom, then everybody could be in that same situation. When she talks and she says he grabbed my face, look at her body languages. She's doing exactly what she says. She's moving her hands. She's illustrating. She's gesturing. She's illustrating exactly what she's saying he did. And he scratched me with his nails. She never mentioned slapping. We know there's 911 calls that talk about slapping. The thing I want you to be cautious of when you're when we're looking at this is we're looking at behavior and body language to see what we believe. Now, we know that people hedge and protect people that are abusing them, but that doesn't make them better liars. And if it does, it takes time. So people will bleed the same body language we're always looking for if they're lying. She doesn't appear to be lying when she says, he used his hand and it, his nails hit her. At about 3.05 or close to the end, when he's asking her, when the police officer is asking Gabby about whether she hit him or not, and she's saying, or whether she grabbed the wheel or not, and she's saying, no, I hit him. Then you see kind of her open body language. She's illustrating and gesturing. She's carrying out the conversation. You see that throughout here when she says, no, he didn't slap me. He didn't hit me. She shakes her head, no. All of her body language is congruent. It, any police officer pulling her over and asking those questions is going to believe that based on the body language we're seeing here. There's also a little bit of emotional eye accessing as she looks down into her right as she's talking about this. I don't see fixation on the vehicle ahead of her, which we did see in the beginning. Now, what that means is tough to say because she's also been on the phone talking to someone and there's a lot of emotion associated with that. She says, I know he gets frustrated. She does some downright eye accessing. And then she says it was the first time and her body language is open. She looks genuine when she says that. And that officer says there's always a first time. He's trying to tell her, look, you're getting yourself into a bind. I'll leave you with this. She's emotional around non-emotional things and she's not emotional around emotional goings on in the relationship. I said that in the first one. And I want to point out that that's an indicator that this emotional kind of behavior that we're seeing is probably part of their relationship, which means there's volatility associated. And the last point in this entire thing is words are levers to action. No excusing any person who hits another person, whether it's male or female in the relationship. And if you're in one of those, you need to get yourself to safety somehow. But words are levers to action. Everything I do as an interrogator is simply a word. People drive each other to places with words. She calls him an idiot. Later, we'll hear him call her crazy. If I call my wife idiot, crazy, those kinds of things, it would not end well. It would not go well. But there is no excuse for violence, for physical violence in this case. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, we see a lot of palm exposure here. This kind of flipping up of the palms. And we're following that. She's pulling her hair to the side away from the officer who's talking to her, which is exposing her neck. And we tend to do that to people that we trust or people that we want to connect with. And the way she's illustrating how he grabbed her face, I think is interesting. It's this, this guy, Brian, is physically communicative. He demonstrates everything that he's talking about when he's talking about his stories. So he is a pretty physical person. And for her not to be emotional and this not to be that big of a deal. So for her to react more emotionally, I think this physical thing was probably more common than not in this relationship. And this is that while she's demonstrating this movement up to her face, this is the one time her left hand is kind of protecting her midsection, which will we're more likely to see women do that than men during times of feeling vulnerable or uh, insecure or maybe even threatened. And I think uh, it's possible that his testimony, Brian's testimony about her grabbing the wheel and her saying that she didn't grab the wheel, but she hit him. 
I think this kind of reveals a good part of how he sees this relationship. If she caused his arm to move, then she controlled the vehicle in his mind. There's a complete transfer of responsibility. So view this from a behavioral perspective. His, uh, his view of the world is largely with this external locus of control. So other people can assume full responsibility for my actions, which would also speak to his testimony, being unable to control Gabby's mood which is also his testimony, which is an external locus. Um, but his own, and he's kind of communicating, there's a history of several failed attempts, which kind of speaks to this external locus. And at the end of the video, this lip retraction that we're seeing here with Gabby is an important thing to notice, no matter what profession you're in, sales, parenting, law enforcement. It, it, when this is exactly when you're seeing a need for reassurance. If, if the lip goes back into the mouth or an object goes into the mouth, it suggests that there's a need for reassurance there. And noticing when lip retraction or something goes into the mouth, when that happens is more important than just understanding the body language. When am I seeing these behaviors? And when do they become more open or closed? So if you're ever profiling anyone outside of a law enforcement thing, we're we're looking for changes in behavior more than we're just looking at behavior. So all four of us, we're looking for changes in behavior. That's what we're really looking about. And I think she's honest about him normally being pretty uh, patient with her, but I think she's honest because they have devolved into a place where some things are normal that probably should not be normal at all. Scott. All right. I'm just going to go with the uh, big stuff and the tight stuff. I'm not going to get all to the things you guys have already covered. We're seeing a, a lot of adapters. That's when the adapters are the things you use that are called pacifying behaviors, coined by Joe Navarro. That's anything you use or do to get rid of that built-up stress or tension. You rub on your hand, you rub on your arms, you rub on your legs, you'll push, and, push on your face, do your chin. We're seeing uh, quite a bit of those because she's under stress at this point from the situation. Um we see her head down a little bit, her head, her chin guarding her neck. Of course, again, it's a stressful situation because she's, they've been pulled over and been separated, and she's by herself. Uh, her legs are close together. Again, another sign of, of the tight body language that indicates she's, she's stressed and might be afraid of what's happening in that situation, what might happen next. Um, her illustrators are small and they're tight. So instead of doing, ah, oh, here's what's going on, her illustrators are very small and, and close to her body. Again, that, that indicates, it denotes that she's under stress at that point. Um, the hair grooming, I think, uh, as Jay said earlier, that's one thing we do when we feel comfortable with or trust the person we're talking to. But at the same time, it can be a way to get rid of heat, and it's pretty hot out there right now. So it could be a combination of both in that situation. Um, her, she's rub, she rubs her arm there toward the end. Again, that's another adapter. And uh, she does the, the uh, adapting uh, leg rub. So th th those are all the big things um, d indicating that she's under stress at this point. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Okay. So uh, one thing I want to point out is, uh, did he hit you? Uh, and then if, if it's okay, if, if you say you hit him. So this to my mind is a technique to minimize the severity of this. So she might, elicit more information to this particular police officer. I think he's minimizing this so he might get more information out of out of her. Correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I think that's where it's going. But what we see after that is, to Chase's point, uh, lip retraction and lip compression. It's, it's difficult to see because the sun is in the camera. You're going to have to explode up the picture a little bit, get right in there. But there is something held back there before she answers did he hit you? There's something she's not going to tell us there, I believe. Uh, she demonstrates very clearly, um, you know, clearly illustrates and demonstrates the grabbing of the face. And after that, she covers her, uh, she covers her elbow. I'm just stopping my phone ringing. Just there. After that, she covers her uh, elbow joint. Um, that would suggest to me, uh, that she's probably inaccurate about what she's saying happened there. I, I would suggest, given what we're going to see in in uh, laundry later on, 
He's also inaccurate about what he says the physical was. I'm going to suggest it's more than both of them demonstrate it is. But both of them, I say, are being deceitful about their demonstration of what happened. I think it had escalated past what they're both demonstrating, okay? Uh, because after that demonstration as well, she goes for her knee joint as well. So not only the, the uh, adapters there are in very specific joint places where you'll go when you're under stress and pressure and you're nervous about what's happening. Uh, the, the, the cop, one of the cops there confirms hyperventilation, which uh, I was talking about in the first video. There is an extreme emotion going on, it, which is including the recovery of hyperventilation. We've got extreme stress has been going on, uh, if not panic. Again, you can put that down to whatever you want to conjecture that might be about. I'm just trying to signal out to you, this is what, from my point of view, we're seeing. Extreme stress, extreme emotions, extreme panic to the, to the level of uh, not only I'm seeing it, but the cops seeing it, hyperventilation is going on. Um, you know, you might see stuff there of, of, of potentially the effect of reactive abuse. You can get that. It's a possibility. It's not a fact. It's a possibility that that's going on. OK, now, what else? Uh, yes, ad, ad, uh, abdomen covering, but also a concave posture. Uh, that is quite an adolescent move. Again, you'll see that in lots of scientific data, especially around the work of Dr. Amy Cuddy, uh, who you may well recognize in the body language world. Not only has she done the big posturing stuff, the power poses, but also the poses that we take when we feel weak. In adolescence, we get a lot of concave posturing. We're seeing that in the car. The car is designed, the vehicle is designed that you don't have to sit like that. She unconsciously is sitting in that concave posture there. As I said before, it's it's quite prevalent in adolescence. I think we're seeing regression here as well. We hear it in the voice. It's the same voice that we hear in her blog videos when there's a big rainstorm, thunderstorm happening, that same tonality. And also there's a primal cadence at the end. So what I mean by primal cadence is the, the intervals between the tones of her voice when she says water are the same intervals that you see, in, that you hear in a child's voice when they're asking a mother or a father or some primal caregiver for a resource they're asking for that attention I, I'd say she's she's regressing back there now all of this to point to what we're seeing around her at the moment which is um, emotional empathy you may well have been feeling this around this whole case an idea of emotional empathy that you relate to her you sympathize with her you you feel what she feels she kind of has something of what you believe is your story she's telling your story that happens when we see big emotions because understand why do we have big emotions so people around us will do something fast for us. They're designed to fix the situation really fast. So what do we get from this officer? The officer has very quick emotional empathy and he starts telling his story. He starts going, well, here's how it's like my situation. That's a classic example of emotional empathy. We're going to see it with Laundry as well. He triggers emotional empathy in the people around him. So they start telling their story. It's not a great thing to do if you want to help people, by the way, is start saying, hey, well, here's how it was for me. What you need is cognitive empathy. That is, there are many scientific uh, uh, papers that say if you're a therapist, if you really want to help people, you want to hit cognitive empathy, not emotional empathy. Because if you're emotionally empathetic, you don't have the capacity to see the whole story and understand how you could best help. In this situation, I believe that there, uh, both she and Laundry are going to be triggering emotional empathy, whether they know it a lot or not, in the people around them. And that's not helping her situation right now. Nothing to do with her, not her fault. 
That's what big emotions are designed to do. Get people active really, really quickly. Some people will get so active, they'll shut you down when you have a big emotion. Some people will get so active, they will feel for you and join in your story and they'll outrank you on their story. They'll have had a, a, a bigger situation like that than you've ever had and then you don't get helped. And sometimes it fits just right and you'll get the exact help you need right there and then, you know, it, if they can work out what that help is, if you're able to ask for it, which you may be not, or they're able to understand what what might it be. Anyway, that's what I got for you on that. Uh, so Greg, so let, let me throw in something, Mark, because you said if they're able to ask. Anybody yeah. is gonna immediately jump to, if there's domestic violence, and guys, I'm, I'm not the domestic violence expert, I'm the shock of capture and that kind of guy expert. If there is, why wouldn't she raise her hand and go help? Well. What we know is a long-term captivity and, and it's a lot of bad abusive relationships or captivity reduces your ability to act because it takes away all of your inputs. I said this in the last video, when they're in this space, the only input they're getting is from each other. And if I'm being told my blog doesn't matter, or I'm being told I'm stupid, I'm an it, all that stuff starts to impact how people behave and it brings down their normal personality, whoever is doing it. If she's doing it to him, he's doing it to her. In this case, we know that he was saying your little blog and he was saying she can't do it and she was losing confidence. Then you lose confidence to act, you lose confidence in decision ability. We know that the shock of capture will take people to a point they won't try to escape anymore, that kind of thing. So what I want you to do is I'm not gonna beat you to death with that. There's a whole lot of details in that. Yeah, I wrote a part in a book called Are You In Love or Captivity? I could post that somewhere. It is about what happens to your brain as you go further and further into that kind of relationship. Now, if we believe her that this is the first time it happened, it might be the beginning of this horrible thing, or it might be later. That's all I got. Bravo, Romeo, India, Alpha, November. And then what? And his reaction was to do what? It's going to be out of Florida. Did he, did he hit you though? I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him, but then I understand if he hit you, but we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Because, you know, where did he hit you? No, don't worry, be honest. Well, you, you know, they never, there's a first time and then it usually 
Let's just, we'll go see what Brian's saying, but uh, I think you've heard everything now from... You Quick question. You said you were hitting him in the arm. Did you grab the steering wheel? No, I didn't. You did not touch the steering wheel? I didn't touch the steering wheel, but only, only, only for like a second, because I just saw the lights come on, and it was more just like, you're an idiot. Like, you know. But did you grab the steering wheel and like no. swerve or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Okay. I didn't touch the steering wheel at all. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close this door again. Do you have enough air back here, or do you want me to kick it up some more? Water. <laughs> I will see if I can find something. Okay, don't no worry. Thank you. All right. Did you already give a statement for this officer? Uh, I've got uh, this gentleman here. Yeah. This gentleman knows that you have some marks on your neck. Yeah. And she's got some marks on her, too. We're just trying to figure out what all happened. And I know you probably already told the story. This officer is probably going to be the one handling the whole case. Do you want to? Listen to what he has to say, and, yeah. and then you tell him. Tell him what happened. Like, so, if you don't mind, start at the beginning for me. Over. Start at the beginning. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to go too far back, but we've been in uh, BLM land for the past like, week or so, traveling okay. around. And the flies here are like pretty intense, so the flies have definitely been getting to her. And then my feet are dirty and everything, so I think that our little squabble started because we were, we were hanging out at the coffee shop, and when we got back to the van, there was some dirt and stuff in the van, and uh, I moved our food around as a result of this you know, so she gets a little weak. Sorry about that. It's okay. Do you need any water? That's okay. It's hot out here. I was right? down we were going to get water because we ran out, but it's okay. No, it's okay. I don't like plastic bottles. Thank you, though. Um, but we just had a little disagreement there. And this disagreement was just that she was getting a little worked up and I was saying, no, it's okay. Thank you so much. It's not nice cool. That's good. <laughs> So it was, just, it was just more of a disagreement than that. I just wanted to say. What was the disagreement about? It was, it was, I wouldn't even call it disagreement. It was just that uh, I'm dirty and I can't change being dirty. Like I got dirty feet, I got sand in my foot pops and stuff like that. Um, it was that we were at uh, the coffee shop for so long because we were there from nine to three. So yeah, there's a few little, little things, little, just little mm -hmm. relationships. I'm, I don't know if you're in a relationship with three. I've been married for over five years now. So. There's a lot of little things. Right? Yeah, I can go. Um, and we, I get we, it. Yeah, we really, we weren't physical before the point where I said, all right, let's, let's just take a breather and, and, like, walk away for a minute. I'll lock the van up, and I'll go for a walk this way, and you can go walk down that way on the block. You know, there's that moon, uh, what is it called, moon flower? Right, yeah. You know, nice areas. You can go either way. It's all shaded. So let's just go for a little walk and breathe and come back. It's pretty, you know, really happy. But, um, but, they, but she's, I said, I'm not upset with her. She got a little worked up, and she had a phone in her hand and a keys and everything. She wanted I know the keys are her rings, mm -hmm. she had her rings, her phone, and I, well, I was holding on to the keys because I just, I didn't want to go anywhere, and my big fear is, I don't have my phone, I don't really, I don't have a phone, so she goes off without me, you know, car, I, I'm on my own, <laughs> so um, I was saying, let's just go for a walk, and she was trying to get the keys for me, so I was just going, just wait back up, back up, and it doesn't, she hit me, and I, I didn't, I didn't get, I don't want to push you, but I didn't get, I didn't get overtly physical, I was just trying to keep her away, and, not get hit. And then I got really loud and I guess probably fear of his attention where I was going, you know, back up, get away, just give me a... Uh, okay, okay, so, so you I, said you pushed her to create some distance, obviously, right? What happened after that? What got, what got the scratches on your eye? The phone. The phone? So you pushed her and she hit you? She was... I wasn't... I, I, it wasn't like a push and she jumped on me. She was, she was already... She was already... I don't want to... She was already swinging and I was pushing her. A lot of angles, a lot of nails, a lot of rings. Yeah, you got yeah, three scratches in your neck. You got one on your left side of your nose. You got one in your face here, and you got four bullets bleeding over there. So you just try to so, put some two nails. Do you mind lifting up your right sleeve for me? I'm curious about something. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I suppose fingernails, but yeah, I'm not complaining. Absolutely. I'm not complaining about Is it bruised or tender or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Okay. I'm fine, and I love you. I hope she doesn't have too many complaints about me. <laughs> I'm just, uh, you know, I, I feel bad I didn't get so public. I was just trying to be loud to this and this is, you know, I just try to make her calm down and be like, look, everyone's watching. I feel like, it's not this. It's just All right, Chase, what do you got? I think it's interesting that he's using the words like little squabble, uh, this little disagreement to describe things that are insignificant. And he's also used the exact same word to describe her blog and her website before. 
And he's even making this little hand gesture to describe how small the interaction was and how meaningless it was. He's staying in this fig leaf groin protection, which is the male equivalent of what women will do when they cover their lower abdomen. And I think this is pretty indicative of some fear going on here. I'll let you guys unpack that. But I want to talk about his story. This is, I hope she doesn't have too many complaints about me. This comes out and he does a confirmation glance between both of the police officers. So his concern is about the social judgment that he's receiving right now or that he could potentially receive. And the second part of this is he's saying, I'm dirty and I can't change being dirty. So her desire for him to be different is what he sees as the cause of the disagreement. So his entire problem was not that they were communicating ineffectively or toxically. I think that's a word. It was all about the desire to, to calm down was because people were seeing them. People were watching them. And this is his statement. And I think this reflects his social concern and the attention being on him. We will typically use our own worries to keep someone else from doing something. So I'm going to use what I'm scared of to make you scared of something. I'm going to use the same thing. And, and that's one of the bad communication strategies. But and we'll, we'll do this not knowing that many times other people's reasons for restricting their behavior might be crazily different than our own. And I think she may have been more fearful of something like abandonment and loss than the social pressure and being embarrassed in front of many people. So everything that he is stressing about is about social judgment and fear of negative social attention that which could lead to like maybe uh, an eventual motive. And this is a wild speculation. Uh, could be from a likely, uh, maybe a threat to expose something about him on the internet, being that all of his concerns are about social judgment and being exposed or having lots of negative social attention on him. I think this is something that we need to be looking for. And it's when he's saying I wasn't overtly physical, he was still physical just in a way that people wouldn't notice, which is the, the meaning of that word to begin with. And I think that's interesting. And one other thing that we're going to see in the next clip is something very revealing about his personal behavior and his psychology and how he views the world uh, coming up. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. So I concur on this on the on the concern around the spectacle of the argument. You know, just as you were saying there and how it looks to others, absolutely picked up on the same thing there. Uh, look, here's what jumps literally jumps to attention for me immediately is how he jumps to attention the moment the, the other cop comes over. He goes from uh, legs crossed, which is if you've got your legs crossed, you are not ready for, for anything. If, if there's an attack coming, if there is a threat coming, you're going to fall over before you're ever ready for that. And that speaks to just how calm he feels he can be or how calm he wishes to project himself at that moment. But it doesn't last long because once he's got a cop on both, so, well, I guess at that point, three cops now, he jumps to attention um, and, and that, you know, uh, and, and, and especially when we, we hear about the masks, uh, the, 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 the marks on the neck as well. Uh, bolt upright, uh, uh, single shrug on that, fig leaf, doesn't know where to look and uh, and starts adapting on his pocket zipper as well. So I think what he's doing is using the zipper to cause his stress and pressure in his in the delicate area of the thumb there. So he's in control of some kind of stimulus. The stimulus that's now coming at him, especially around the ideas of marks on the neck, has triggered him into a real threat state there. He's gone from the projection of calm or maybe even somewhat calm. And remember, you know, in, in video one, we talked about him being uh, calm at the wheel and overly familiar with the cop there, calls him buddy immediately. So whether he's calm or not, there's a sense of, I want you to see that I'm really calm around this. Uh, we start to see him uh, after he said, well, I don't want to go too far back. Uh, well, you know, that would be the point where I might go, no, go on. 
go, go as far back as you like. I've, I've got time. We can hear about this. So I would like to know how far back would you go that it would put you under even more stress to start talking about this? How far back do we need to go to really get where the start of this whole incident uh, really is? We see covering of knuckles, covering of joints. So again, there's a real threat for him around here. Now, what's interesting here to my point earlier about emotional empathy is he starts getting information from the cop. <laughs> the cop actually says, well, I've been married five, five years. Why is the cop confiding in him? Well, because he's able, again, with the state that he's in, to start getting another human being to confide and get them to join in on the story and see their own story in him. Okay, to to get emotional empathy with him. We even get the other cop later on starting to join in a pantomime of like, here's what I think happened. He's literally adopted a character in the story and he's playing out that character. Now, that, that cop has no idea what was happening, but that you can perform a story at the emotional level that means other human beings will join in in, a, in order to try and save save you essentially, save you from the pain of the emotions in that story, or save themselves having to watch that story by jumping in with their their own. Remember, one of the reasons we'll join in with emotional empathy is we're not used to the other person's pain, but we're used to ours. And we'd rather take over with our own story and see ourselves in there than actually really experience what their individual true pain is. I think we get two cops, who want to join in on this. It's all too, all too emotional, all too painful, uh, to the extent that we're going to start to see his language break up. So we get things like a lot of anger on her nails, on her rings. That's not a, a real sentence. He's now just talking in images. In the next video, we'll see what the cop starts to make out of that, that his language has started to split up. And that maybe speaks, Chase, to something of what you're talking about as to what his... Uh, emotional state is uh, there. Uh, I think, oh, and, and last last thing uh, around this, uh, we went we, we went physical before, um, uh, yeah, we weren't physical before that point. Okay, so you were physical, okay? So you're telling us you were physical and he models uh, the push away, which again, is different from what Gabby modeled. There's a discrepancy into what, in what he, he shows happened and she shows happened. And we now know that both of those examples, one of them is somewhat different from what both of them modeled. So um, he is really downplaying any potential, uh, the, the idea of physical. She downplays it somewhat, okay? Uh, she does get, the, a witness did say a face was grabbed. Another witness says there was a slap. Neither of them model that. So both of them, and you'll be able to work out what you feel the reasons are around that. Both of them are trying to minimize and get people to join in with the story around this. And they're being successful uh, around that. I think that's all I have for you on that. Uh, Scott, what do you got? Um, we see something here we haven't seen up to this point. In the very first videos where they when they pull him out of the car, we do see his his hands together a little bit, not much. But as we go along, those go away, and almost completely. And here we see it almost the whole time his hands begin right down in front of him. But that starts when he starts talking about the problem she has with him. And when the, when they don't get along, something's happening. He, I'm dirty. I have this happening. I have that happening. He talks about those things. And that's when he starts, his body language starts shutting down. His arms get close. He's, his brain's trying to protect his body. He doesn't feel good about what he's saying because he knows he's riding that edge of getting in trouble or not getting in trouble. And he really doesn't know where he's sitting with all this yet. Um, so everything's really tight. And he's smiling a lot because, of course, he's trying to get, get along with these guys and, and make it look like he's the best guy in the world. We know differently now. Um, but one of the great things I thought about these police officers was the officer says, hey, I know you probably, have you told him your story yet? You know, because he's got to tell the story four or five times because they know and you're trained to do this. You ask them to tell the story to three or four different people and see if anything changes in there. 
Because if it does, and they're, they're getting the baseline on the story. Here's the beginning. Here's the first story he told. What is he adding to it? What is he leaving out by the third, fourth time he tells the story? It's very important. So that's why they're all paying attention. That's why he says, did you tell him that story? You're probably going to have to. Because when he tells them it, they're all going to be listening. They won't say, ah, this is, uh, you left this out. What happened there? Not at all. They'll get over here and talk about it and see what's different and then start poking around on what, what was left out or what was added at that point. Um, all right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to tie some of what you've all talked about together. <clears throat> Number one, Mark leaning back with his legs crossed, his hands are disengaged. That's because he's gotten comfortable with the police officers he's talking to. If you notice, when he says, if you talk to this guy, he's the arresting officer, whatever he says, investigating officer, his body language tightens up. He's not comfortable with this guy. He's comfortable with the other guy. By the way, this is the guy who pulled him over. So he, he does a thread ID and his hands cross. Then they ask him about a water bottle and he shows, look, I really appreciate it, but he puts his hand to his chest. We'll see that again. But he touches his chest in appreciation. Watch him as he starts to tell his story and he goes to internal conversation. He drops down to his left about what should I say? How should I say it? Because all of us are going to do that when we're in front of the police officer. If it's and it's going to be more pronounced, the more complex and the more dangerous what I have to say is. So pay attention to that. That's what should I say? Chase, the only reason I would say little may not mean anything in this case is because he says little matter, little, uh, little disorganized, little thing. I think if you were to find his father or whoever he's closest to and they talk all the time, little is part of their conversation because he uses it so many ways. In the beginning, you, you look at it and think, OK, I agree. It's belittling when you say her little blog, but I think he just uses this word, not standing up for him in the way he treated her with that. Um, then we get to, he says it went physical. Look, guys, I, I can speak for myself. Those words don't exist in my relationship. Those are guilty words. When you talk about things going physical, I would venture to say the four of us don't have those in our relationships. That means that that is a thing that you have to put words to. So that means something is going on in this relationship. I said last time, you can see a lot of things here. You can tell he's controlling when he talked about taking the keys to get in the vehicle, controlling and a person who has a fear of losing control of things or a bad combination. Then he talks about getting worked up and he said something that's really interesting. Either you said, I don't, I didn't have my phone or I didn't, I don't have a phone, not sure which. We know he has a phone. So if he said that he's lying. <clears throat> then he says, I didn't get overtly physical. In this case, Mark, I think he just doesn't use the word correctly. I think he's talking about, you know, really aggressive physically. And if that's the case, that really means that this has happened before. Uh, then the cop starts covering what he's told him. He drops his hand to his sides and he starts to adapt as he's retelling the story. And he turns to an oblique to that cop when he starts talking about it not being a big deal. I pushed her off. Mark, I think you're right. I think what's going on is there's more to it than we think, than either one of them is willing to tell us. And then he crosses his torso with a barrier. He does a little chained elephant slightly, and he socializes. I hope she doesn't have too many complaints against me. Guys, all of this is coming together as a, a, a relationship where they were comfortable with some level of physical violence, whether she's hitting him, he's hitting her. Don't know. Don't know where it went, but there's something that is dangerous when you start hitting each other using words like idiot, stupid, crazy. Those kinds of things, those are escalation paths. And that kind of stuff never ends well. It's what I said last time, the reason I knew this doesn't end well. I don't know how it ended. It's not important for me to tell you how it ended. Just know that these are not healthy relationships. And I'll leave it at that. Did you already give a statement to this officer? Uh, I this gentleman here. Disagreement there, and 
this game was just that she was getting a little worked up, but I was saying, no, it's okay, thank you so much. As long as cool, that's good. <laughs> So it was, just, it was just more of a disagreement than I just wanted to say. What was the disagreement about? It was, it was, I wouldn't even call it disagreement. It was just that uh, I'm dirty and I can't change being dirty. Like I got dirty feet, I got sand in my foot pops and stuff like that. Um, it was that we were uh, at the coffee shop for so long because we were there from nine to three. So I guess there's a few little, little things, little, just little mm -hmm. relationships. I don't know if you have a relationship with them. I've been married for over five years now. So. There's a lot of little things. That, yeah. yeah, I can go. Um, and we, I get we, it. Yeah, we really... We weren't physical before the point where I said, "All right, let's let's just take a breather and, and like walk away for a minute. I'll lock the van up and I'll go for a walk this way, and you can go walk that way on the block. You know, there's that moon, the, what is it called, moon flower? Right. Yeah. You know, nice areas. You can go either way. It's all shaded, so let's just go for a little walk and breathe and come back. Just breathe. Yeah, we're happy. Um, but then but she's, I said, I'm not upset with her. She got a little worked up and she had a phone in her hand and keys and everything. And she wanted. I know the keys are her rings, mm -hmm. she had her rings, her phone, and I, well, I was holding on to the keys because I just, I didn't want to go anywhere, and my big fear is, I don't have my phone, I don't really, I don't have a phone, so she goes off without me, you know, car, I, I'm on my own, <laughs> so um, I was saying, let's just go for a walk, and she was trying to get the keys for me, so I was just going, just wait back up, back up, and it doesn't she hit me, and I, I didn't, I didn't get, I don't want to push you, but I didn't get, I didn't get overtly physical, I was just trying to keep her away, and, not get hit. And then I got really loud and like that's probably fear of his attention where I was going, you know, back up, get away, just give me a Okay, okay so, so I, you said you pushed her to create some distance, obviously, right? What happened after that? What got, what got the scratches on your eye? The phone. The phone? So you pushed her and she hit you? She was, I wasn't, I, I, it wasn't like a push and she jumped on me. She was, she was already, she was already, I don't want to, she was already swinging and I was supposed to a lot of angles, a lot of nails, a lot of rings. Yeah, you got yeah, three scratches in your neck. You got one on your left side of your nose. You got one in your face here, and you got four bullets bleeding over there. So you just try to so, put some two nails. Do you mind lifting up your right sleeve for me? I'm curious about something. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, 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 I suppose fingernails, but yeah, I'm not complaining. Absolutely. I'm not complaining about Is it bruised or tender or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Okay. I'm fine, and I love you. I hope she doesn't have too many complaints about me. <laughs> I'm just, uh, you know, I, I feel bad I didn't get so public. I was just trying to be loud to this and this is, you know, I just try to make her calm down and be like, look, everyone's watching. You know, like, stop this. Just hang tight for me. Excellent. Let's move on. What do you got? Yeah, so as the officer approaches, uh, just, a, just a question, it's quite Columbo, isn't it? And I think we immediately see the chin rise, bit of a chin jut there, um, and a sway from side to side. We're now seeing a little bit of aggression build up and having to be kind of controlled, a little bit of bravado now. I think he's now feeling the pressure even more. And one of the strategies going on is, is unconscious is maybe I get, maybe I front this one up a bit more. Maybe I get a bit angry, maybe a bit more of the fight rather than the flight starts to kick in now. Remember the first resp in fight and flight as a good general rule, okay? It, always starts with flight because it's way more economical. You get yourself out of the situation, you'll always get less damage, okay? Fight is the second chance, after that is the play dead response, essentially. Uh, and there's a, there's a feint, uh, you know, as the play dead response as the other, as the other F there. But uh, chin jut, 
feeling of bravado under the stress, swing from side to side. That's often an indicator of aggression or that somebody's feeling like cutting and running. What's interesting for me is the, the cop here puts a finger on something that, that I've been feeling throughout is this choppy language. Yes, one of the things I'd be asking is, you want any kind of medication right now? Because I understand that there's some um, some ideas out there, good ideas around uh, that he may have a social disorder. Uh, the one that's specifically uh, being pushed towards is a possibility, along with others, along with many other potential uh, disorders, some of which would be medicated for, and some of which we're seeing those patterns of behavior coming, coming out here. Um, very dangerous if you've got some of them all together and, and the person isn't on their medication. Uh, we know from other from other witness statements that there are such things as uh, the possibility of auditory hallucinations going on. Again, that speaks to something quite profound going on that that often really needs medicating. Anyway, it's a good question. Um, are you are you on medication? We don't get to hear that that's been taken out, but somebody at his age, on the whole, the answer to that is kind of a yes or a no. Like if you're that young, you're either on medication or you're not on medication. You know, at my age now, there's a whole bunch of medication. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. The doctors are going, you should take this. You should have this. Your, your heart will really enjoy this. Take that as well. So, you know, if you ask me, hey, Mark, uh, you want medication? It's like, oh, okay, well, let's, <laughs> how long have you got? Okay. So, but for a, a young guy like that, for me, it would feel like a yes or no answer. So, so I simply go, why all that activity for him around that? We're not hearing some of it, but there's a lot of nonverbals coming in there that suggest when he, he doesn't give a, a clear answer on that, he deflects on that, and and the and there's some shrugs in there. There's some breaking of eye contact. There could be some self medication going on around that, and again, it may well speak to other psychological disorders which are not the initial popular one that people are going for okay not saying you're wrong not saying you're right not saying i'm wrong not saying i'm right it's just what we want to do is explore the possibilities when we're looking to be you know cognitive about this um uh yeah and and Yes, he says, he says, well, the reason for his anxiety or why he's hyper is, you know, it gets your heart rate up when you when you see those lights flash. Instantly thinks to me, well, how many, have you seen that before? How many times have you seen that then? Are you around some of that? Do you see that constantly? Maybe the case. Last little thing on this, he creates doubt at the end. She's crazy. You know, she on medication. Ah, she's crazy. I don't think so. Not that I know of. You know, use there in a very short amount of time with people that he's built rapport with to the extent that they will join in the play with him and become characters to help him out. He's now casting doubt on the other party here. Quite, quite skillful. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, brilliant, man. I uh, totally agree. I, th and I, I think this hyper cooperative behavior that we're seeing in all of this is indicative of a behavioral pattern. So if we look at behavior from on a pendulum, we have collapse on one side, we have composure kind of here in the middle. And way over here, we have posturing someone who's going to over posture and, and be someone who they're not. People who spend a lot of time in collapse, especially when they're also viewing the world through a lens of this external locus of control. Uh, he's even referencing his heart rate and the police lights using the word you instead of himself to where it's, it doesn't even belong to him. He's not even in control of anything. These kind of people may reach a point that makes them extremely frustrated. So if you live in this kind of collapsed side of everything, which is also indicated in the social media posts where he's featured uh, many times, for many of us, if we're sitting over here in collapse, the solution to collapse looks like I need to do the opposite of what I'm doing now, except that's posturing. 
So people who spend a while kind of living as a doormat or defaulting to this kind of hyper cooperative behavior, uh, they look across and see the opposite. And this is, this is the wild reaction that we can get out of people who are hyper compliant on a very regular basis and are tired of it. And they get to a, a point where they say the words, somebody snapped, people use that word. And it's, it's not that they snapped, they felt a desire to no longer be in collapse. And they thought, you know, that is the only way out is to go to the opposite end of what I'm doing now. And I think that there's another term. We are the only animals that we know of that have real language and evolved language and social skill. So we animals have fight, flight, freeze, or faint. And I think we in, we are adding one in there called friend. Every single one of us knows at least one person that when ev- all the crap goes down, their first and number one default instinct is to, I'm going to make friends with this person. I'm going to be innocent. I'm going to I'm going to connect as much as I can with this other person and try to resolve this by friending instead of all the other others. And this is potentially what we're seeing here. But keep in mind that we're we're looking for cl- clusters of behavior and we're looking for a pattern of behavior. But I'd like you to just to see that this social trigger for him is very powerful. And this regression trigger is really telling. Because I think a lot of people, most people, when we're under severe stress or when we enter this, as we're abbreviating as, as fight or flight, when we enter that state, we tend to default from how we got acceptance, how we got uh, protected ourselves as children or how we got affection from the authority figures in our lives as we're growing up. And we default to that. So some people you'll see become very helpful. Some become very friendly. Some become reserved. Some cry because that's how they got uh, attention or affection. And we learn these patterns and carry them unconsciously into adulthood. So we're seeing a lot about his behavior here and the potential uh, for something that's the opposite of collapsing, which is a severe version of posturing. I think that's the longest I've ever gone on a video. And I apologize. I hope it was helpful. Good stuff. Don't God, apologize, yeah. man. Good stuff, you got man. that, dude. You slammed it. That was good. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, man. Get up in it. All right. I'll go short again. We see some childlike behavior here because his arms have gone from those uh, to in front of him, uh, guarding the groin and doing all his adapters, his arms are straight down by his side, and it looks so weird him standing you know, there like that. Uh, there's no loping still in his voice, like Mark pointed out earlier. He's just sort of everything's just kind of pouring out as quick as he can get it out. How does being it go? A fast talker. <laughs> that's a being a fast talker. I understand that, you know. So it's easy for me to understand what he, where he's coming from. Because it's you just and when you're stressed, man, it just starts blowing out of there really, really quick. Um, now on the drug thing, though, they they mute that part out. I think he used to have. I think he used to take something for drug. You know, used to take drugs, and because he does say no after that, no, I don't take anything. So right after that, listen for that because he says no, I don't. I'm I'm not taking anything. So I'm sure what he did was a quick list of what he was taking. So Mark, I think he scored there. And the, so they had to had to beat that out. If I had to guess anything at all, I would say it was something like Adderall or something for, for some personality, you know, maybe uh, anti you know any anxiety medication, something like that. Because I looked and looked and looked and watched a couple of times. It looks like he says anxiety one time. Um, so that's what I've got there. And I think he feels the thread is lower at this point. That's why his hands are at his sides. He's trying to, to be, you know, be friends with these guys as going to y'all's extra F there. And he's trying to, to connect with them. And so he can get along with them and, and have, have a uh, common ground with them. You know, I think that's why they're trying to, as they engage him and ask him when he says, I don't know if you're in a relationship or not. And the police officer says, well, I've been married for five years. That's just one way of, of, um, trying to get that person to keep talking. Oh yeah, man, I understand. I told you, Greg and I did this on, on the, um, interview we did last week with someone, um, which you'll see, we, we were saying things we hadn't, we, we had nothing, we didn't do these things, but we would agree and say, Oh, we, we have done that before. I understand that the guy is probably married, but he's trying to connect with him and he's letting him connect with him. So that's what that's about. In my opinion, that's what I think. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah. So yes, when you get pulled over by a police officer, your emotions ramp, everything goes, your adrenal cortex kicks in all this stuff cranks your head up and it turns off your thinking brain that usually doesn't last for 20 minutes 
usually it settles. And he has been here long enough to be familiar with these people. The fact his body language is jittery and he's cranked up, he still has adrenaline. This guy is cued on it, wondering if he's doing some kind of drug, taking some kind of drug. Now, I'm going to say these police officers are better at figuring out if somebody's on drugs than I am based on pupil dilation and all those other things, and they'd be looking for it. So I'm assuming he's thinking no. The second part then is why? 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 Why are you so jacked up? What are you so concerned about? What's causing you to still have that level of fight or flight? He clearly doesn't see the guy as a threat. So is there something in the van he's trying to hide? Is there something else he's trying to hide? Does he know about a second something or something else? Don't know. But there's certainly a reason why you look for that level of anxiety, that level of jacked up after this is 16 minutes into the video, I think. He also does a half, the only time I see him do anything, he does a half fig leaf, watch his hand, reach for his groin, and then pause and then go back out. So he's conscious of how, how that is. And then I'm just gonna leave it at this. He socializes, she's crazy. That's a that's a fire across the, the bow with what you think and see how it's perceived and you go from there. Guys, I'll, I'll go back to saying, if you are only getting your inputs from another person and you're getting the input that you've got the power in the relationship, they've got none, or they're telling you you're stupid, or they're telling you that you're lazy, all that stuff starts to wear on people and they start to escalate. And if you have a natural propensity to do the wrong thing, escalation is powerful. I'm not gonna tell you that I know what happened, but I could see in that first, the first time we looked at this, I said, this doesn't end well, because you can see all that language, all that stuff in there that this was not going to go well. And in a small environment where you're rattling over the same things over and over and over and over and over, and you're just feeding each other's problem, it's a horrible thing, not an excuse, not a reason that somebody should injure anyone else. As I said yesterday on another video, if you're hitting someone or someone's hitting you, stop, get out, get away from that now. There's no excuse for that. So what I got. I got a quick question for you, Ryan. Sure. Do you take medications or anything like that? Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. Just hit that little red thing down there that says subscribe, and you'll be a, a member. You'll be a panelist, just like just like us. And just hit that little bell and let you know when we have something new come out. We good? You know, I'm just going to say one thing, which is if you've seen anything here that feels a bit familiar to you and you recognise for yourself or others, I want to stick a number down below that you can call and somebody will talk to you about that. So if you see anything familiar in your life or somebody else's, call the number, have a chat. Excellent. All right. Yeah, be sure you do that. Okay, we're good? Good. See you next time. All right. See you next time. Yeah, I don't know why I guess I don't know.